The annual Africa Development Bank meetings hosted in Nairobi, Kenya, provided the perfect opportunity for South Africa to engage with African trade partners on a key topic that's made headlines since 2023 BRICS Plus. Under the theme Fostering Inclusive Growth, BRICS Plus and Africa, the South African BRICS Business Council explored trade and investment opportunities for the continent. The SA chapter of the BBC visited various business councils. I was here in Nairobi last year and traveled to other parts of the continent. And we did that not only to run the support, but also to collectively identify opportunities that are available for us within the BRICS Plus countries. Today's breakfast is a continuation of the campaign towards a collective and mutually beneficial voice. The AFCFTA has the potential to help unlock opportunities in Africa's non-extractive sectors, whilst at the same time deepening the beneficiation of minerals found on our shores, which have become increasingly critical in the new economies. Expanded economic activity and interregional trade can become inclusive, can also become climate compatible in a sustainable manner if supported by enabling policies. The BRICS Plus provides a platform to explore and capitalize on the available opportunities for the continent. Through direct investment, technology transfer, and knowledge exchange, we can benefit. We can also share our own technologies and knowledge. The BRICS Plus countries are, as you know, in the main emerging economies with growing middle class and a substantial consumer market. So for us as business, expanding into these markets can lead to growth opportunities for our continent. I have no doubt that the speakers will inform, they'll enthuse, and they will challenge us to seize the opportunities that this continent present with a specific focus on the intersection between the AFCFTA and BRICS Plus, which now, of course, includes two other countries uh, on the continent, Egypt and Ethiopia, in addition to South Africa. The platform showcased key opportunities South Africa has on offer to increase trade and employment and fill the much-needed gaps to transform Africa's financial architecture. Uh, South Africa um, is, a, is a, an exciting country. It's a country that is proudly forging ahead and inspiring new ways. Uh, we had to take advantage of this opportunity when we're discussing investment opportunities on the continent and show you a snippet of what the continent has to offer in the corner of South Africa. The attractiveness of the country really goes beyond uh, the natural resources, the tourism attraction, but there's a lot of opportunities also for strategic investments in South Africa. The country still boasts really one of the most sophisticated financial infrastructures and is growing in leaps and bounds, especially in the telecoms uh, area. It is still one of the preferred in, um, investment destinations with about 50% of the foreign multinationals headquartered in South Africa. And it just goes to show what opportunities the rest of the continent has also in terms of development. South Africa has established a um, country investment strategy, especially um, established to ensure that we are able to put in place systems and opportunities to attract strategic investment into the country. There have been sectors that have been classified specifically to attract investments, and these are sectors that um, will offer future growth opportunities, those sectors that are, will be labor-intensive, and sectors that are, will also 
transcend into the, the, the new job roles, jobs of the future, so to say. The more traditional sectors still remain as key. We have mining sector that is really well entrenched in South Africa and the subsectors that fall under it. Manufacturing sector that talks to even transport and logistics, as well as the textile and furniture industries that are growing in South Africa. We also have even the knowledge-based economies or subsectors from the financial services, um, ICT, and, and even medical devices and supplies. Those are opportunities that are available to investors that are in, interested in entering into the South African market. Food security is, remains critical to South Africa and the rest of the continent, and I'm quite well aware of that. 35% uh, of the sector is contributing to the continent's GDP. 70% of the sector's employment uh, uh, is, is, is female. Uh, this is important because we all know the role that females play in, in each household. And then it is expected that this sector should grow about, by about 500% by 2030, uh, showing the leaps and, and showing the potential of the sector. Even the World Economic Forum has highlighted the importance um, of the agricultural sector and, and, and food security in terms of development for the continent. South Africa still is a key investor uh, on the continent. We had an engagement with the High Commissioner yesterday, and he was highlighting how uh, South Africa is one of the top four investors um, in Kenya, and also reflected on the importance, of course, of boosting the intra-Africa trade and investment, and also for us to attract investments from Kenya into South Africa. So there's a lot of opportunity for that. Um, the Public Investment Corporation um, is strongly invested in, in the continent and in South Africa as well. That's an, a state-owned entity in South Africa. Green economy is a big opportunity and that we see going forward. Uh, we were able as South Africa to attract a lot of uh, key investments specifically into that sector. Uh, South Africa is the second um, largest attractor of um, investments into the continent, according to the EY Attractiveness Study. Uh, we are behind Egypt, but those opportunities that we've seen uh, grow in leaps and bounds or within the green economy and the re renewable sector. Logistics and transformation are key for the development, of course, of intra-Africa trade and boosting that. And that's part of the discussion that we'll have today. And it's important to, for us to zone in on that and see those opportunities and also leveraging the ocean's economy and how we can uh, enhance intra-Africa trade. South Africa was able to ship the first consignment under the AFC FTA uh, to Ghana, Egypt, Rwanda and Tunisia uh, early this year at the end of January, which was very exciting for the country because we can see that the, uh, the agreement um, the Inter-Africa Continental Tr Free Trade Agreement is will honestly um, put, enhance Inter-Africa trade and there's a lot of opportunities that uh, we can access from that platform. Telecommunications, as I mentioned earlier, jobs of the future are integral to the growth, not only of South Africa, but of the continent. Um, there's a lot of um, heavy investments into that sector, into South Africa, but uh, the key um, aspect of it is the potential for growth uh, on the on the continent. Uh, you can see the numbers in terms of projection, in terms of the scale of the industry by 2029, up to 82 um, billion dollars, which is offers the uh, the continent uh, uh, huge opportunities. Um, South Africa's broadband Infraco, which is a state-owned company, is well invested into the continent. We have other companies and the mobile telecoms industry like MT and Vodacom that also have in a lot of interest into the rest of the continent and in South Africa. And that shows that that sector has a lot of potential. Forging sustainable partnerships for growth resonates with Africa's leading development finance institution, the African Development Bank. Speaking on partnerships, Secretary General of the AFDB Group, Professor Vincent Nemihili took this opportunity to reiterate the AFDB Group's commitment to development finance for growth. BRICS Plus and Africa Partnerships for Sustainable Development in Africa resonates deeply with the core mission of the African Development Bank Group and emphasizes the economic transformation of Africa, which goes to the core of the theme of this year's annual meetings of the Bank Group. 
Africa's Transformation, the African Development Bank, and the reform of the global financial architecture. The BRICS Business Council was established during the fifth BRICS Summit in Durban, South Africa, in March 2013. Since then, we have witnessed remarkable progress. The recent 2023 summit in South Africa saw the inclusion of five new countries, Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE, transforming BRICS into what we now know as BRICS Plus. This expansion underscores the growing importance of the need for collaboration in driving economic and sustainable development in the African, on the African continent. The mandate of the South African BRICS Business Council is to strengthen and promote economic, trade, business, and investment ties among BRICS Plus countries. This mandate aligns perfectly with our goals at the African Development Bank Group. Today, I would like to highlight several key areas where the BRICS Plus partnerships can significantly impact our continent's growth and development. First, economic collaboration. The African continental free trade area presents unprecedented opportunities for market access and intra-Africa trade. By adhering to the rules of origin, we ensure that goods undergo substantial transformation within member countries, benefiting from preferential trade arrangements. The immediate impact of the free trade area will be, will be seen through tariff and service offers that enhance market access, stimulate trade, and drive local production and industrial capacity. Second, the, the development of the key FCFTA value chains. We must focus on agriculture, agro-processing, automotive and vehicle parts, pharmaceutical, pharmaceuticals, services, transportation, logistics, and distribution. Accelerating these value chains will contribute to economic growth, facilitate access to technology, and diversify our export markets. Third, addressing trade patterns. It is crucial to continuously address trade patterns to identify and address deficits by tackling barriers such as bilateral investment agreements we can improve our export and import performance. And let me also add, by tackling the bottlenecks that are at our, our borders, where the customs and the immigration as corrupt people prevent poor market women and men to move across the borders to sell their goods and services. Third, Fourth, knowledge exchange. Transforming education and skills development is essential for our future. BRICS Plus countries must collaborate with Africa to intensify programs focused on education, technology, and empowerment. Today, AI is ruling the world. Where is Africa? By unlocking potential within our partnerships, we can drive economic progression and innovation. In addition, mindful that the infrastructure investment deficit on the African continent is estimated at between 70 to $100 billion annually. BRICS Plus has a strategic role in addressing this deficit. The collaboration between the New Development Bank, NDB, and the African Development Bank Group through our MOU is crucial in jointly identifying, preparing, and co-financing projects 
in countries of mutual interest. Also, on energy transition, it will be important for African countries to partner with BRICS Plus to achieve a just and equitable energy transition. Of course, the debate on energy transition, you all know. But you can only transition from one thing to the other. It will transition from zero to nothing. I'm sure I, I passed the message now. Africa's, Africa's, South Africa's chairing of BRICS in 2023 under the theme BRICS in Africa, Partnerships for Mutually Accelerated Growth, Sustainable Development, and Inclusive Multilateralism highlighted this crucial aspect. In this vein, initiative by the South African BRICS Business Council, such as the commitment to establishing an African Center of Excellence to network with other centers of excellence across Africa and BRICS countries to collaborate on just energy transition projects is a critical step in this important endeavor. The implementation of the AFCFTA allows the African continent to boost its economy to be more globally competitive. As a High Commissioner to Kenya, Mnino Masangu laid the foundation of the achievement that can be achieved with an effective AFCFTA. The AFCFTA is anticipated to leave at least 30 million people out of extreme poverty um, and raise the income of about 68 million others who live in less than five U.S. dollars per day. These are observations by the World Bank and the UN Economic Commission for Africa, not just political rhetoric by our leaders. We therefore need to embrace, embrace it and indeed accelerate its implementation. If I may just say, comment a little bit, AFCFTA, it's one of the programs which has been uh, approved by AU spirily, in a very, very, very spirily way. I think many of the programs have taken years and years and years. If I'm correct, it only taken seven years to approve FCFTA. That means something, it tells us something that we need to drive now to quick and implementation of the FCFTA, which is very good from the side of the AU. It didn't take them a long time to approve this program. We have witnessed also the expansion of the BRICS into the BRICS Plus. Similarly, more developing countries are expected to join us. Ladies and gentlemen, in this regard, the expansion of this ex uh, respective groupings within the context of AFCFTA present even more opportunities, while the opportunity to fully exploit opportunities of the FCFTA relies primarily on the membership of regional economic communities. Therefore, a no African country. Therefore, there is no African country will be left behind. On the other hand. The expansion of the BRICS brings together an enlarged area of developing countries to assist each other's economy development. In this connection, the development over reliance on the traditional Western partners is counterbalanced by reliance on Saraf as South South cooperation as well as intra Africa trade, investment, and cooperation. What makes this shift an imperative is what Karl Marx called the vagaries of the global economy as well as witness with the 28 global financial meltdown and the unexpected global disaster such as COVID-19 pandemic which exposed the over-dependency on the traditional Western market which we really have to change and focus on something that will, will not make us be caught unaware when such pandemics comes us 
and catch with us. As we implement the AFCFTA, ladies and gentlemen, there will be some challenges. I must be honest with you. Now, I just want to get to one or two without any waste of time. One of those things is infrastructural and connectivity deficit, which we must address. I wish you can talk to that during your conference deliberations. And the other challenges are exogenous, such as the trade agreements we entered into with the developed countries which have to be complementary to the viability of the AFCFTA. While the African economies are comparatively small and have an over-reliance on the export of unprocessed a raw materials. The AFCFTA was envisaged to turn the situation around by enhancing inter Africa trade of value added goods, though economic integration through in economic integration, beneficiation, and creation of a single market. We are aware that according to to the United States Economic Commission for Africa, reports intra-trade, report intra-Africa trade as a share of global trade has been on a steady decline and has remained for many years marginal compared to trade within countries outside the continent. Our intra our in the industries in Africa have remained a relatively small scale and our infrastructure development has been of the snail pace and these are some of the factors that have affected the development of the African industry. Hence, we are still largely dependent on trading in basic commodities. More than 75% of Africa exports consist of activities extractive commodities, whereas only 40% of inter-activities trade were extractive. The AFCFTA has the potential to reverse the trend of trading in basic commodities and bring more, many more benefits to the continent. Dr. Stavros Nikolaou, member of the SA BRICS Business Council, joined online to explain the achievements of BRICS trade relations and how best this block can benefit and provide opportunities for the rest of Africa. At our 2023 BRICS Business Council Annual General Meeting, um, the five what were then BRICS Business Council members jointly adopted the Trade and Investment Promotion Statement as a key driver around which uh, the BRICS Business Council Plus program of work and discourse for 2023 and for the next 10 years will pivot to. And this is very much a work in progress. The next decade must inject a level of pragmatism into the work program of the, of the BRICS Business Council with tangible trade and investment gains for partner nations. A significant priority for the South African chapter during 2023, and it flows into the work of the council in 2024, was to analyze what the trade patterns look like across the four uh, BRIC partner countries. And now we will expand this, of course, to include the other five. So what do South Africa's trade patterns look like? look like with these four countries and the other five that are newly joined. And uh, what we have found, of course, is that in each instance, in the case of Brazil, Russia, India, China, uh, there has been a trade deficit. And, and that trade deficit is most manifest with China, as you would expect, China being the biggest economy. And trade deficits are important to identify because we also have a trade deficit with the African continent and these BRIC countries, and I will speak about that in a few moments. But suffice to say that trade deficits are not problematic. Um, 
if the purpose of identifying them is to see those opportunities that emerge for Africa and South Africa in our case to export more finished products and import less finished products because our trade pattern is very much one of exporting raw materials and then importing finished products at significantly higher prices to what the raw materials were exported. So that is and will continue to be a significant focus for us uh, in the months and, and years ahead is evening out these trade patterns uh, whilst we grow trade, but also assisting our economies to become less raw material export prone and more finished products, particularly additive manufactured products to be exported. We want to enhance trade through bilateral agreements with the BRICS Plus nations, explore the value chain opportunities of BRICS Plus with Africa as a joint partner, in line with the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement and the, the, um, the, the, the free trade agreement and the free trade areas that are being developed are a significant part of the strategy to, of course, grow the African economy, but also to address some of the lack of industrialization I was speaking about earlier, the immense benefits to aggregating volumes and getting economies of scale on the continent and leveraging those economies of scale with the BRICS and BRICS plus countries. So that will remain an important part of our position. I can pivot to the next slide, which um, reads BRICS plus Africa trade. Now, earlier I spoke about the trade patterns between South Africa and the four BRIC countries, and that in, in the instance of each one of those, uh, South Africa had a trade deficit. Let me uh, try and give a glimpse of what um, Africa's trade looks like. Um, and I'm looking at not the slide that I wanted, but um, I'll speak to it anyway. Okay, so if we have a look at the slide called BRICS plus Africa trade, um, this particular slide uh, demonstrates what the trade picture looks like in Africa. And uh, I think suffice to say that Africa's trade with BRICS plus is heavily weighted, as you would expect, to raw materials and minerals being exported. Um, but this is where the opportunity resides for us to um, more actively beneficiate products and produce finished products for export purposes. Uh, the Africa continental free trade area, as I said, is an essential part to achieving that. Um, and alone is insufficient to prove Africa's competitiveness, although it will play a significant role in doing so. We do rely on other partners such as BRICS um, to leverage further volumes and economies of scale to increase not only our export capability, but also our intra-trade between our different countries on the continent. But those volumes and economies of scale are, are still insufficient to make us globally competitive as Africa. And that is why we do need to leverage the volumes and economy and, and scale of other jurisdictions, such as, for example, uh, the BRIC and now BRIC plus countries these are massive markets. You would have heard earlier this morning that uh, BRICS Plus represents around 48% of the world's population, uh, around 38% of its GDP, um, and there are some significant markets scale-wise in the BRICS Plus formation, and this presents a further opportunity together with the free trade area in Africa uh, to leverage significant economies of scale and volume throughputs in our manufacturing facilities for export purposes, exports critical to the continent in terms of bridging the trade deficit that I was speaking about earlier and reversing some of the, uh, what are rather um, concerning but at the same time present opportunities are, are the uh, uneven trade patterns that we experience on the continent. Okay, to reduce this trade deficit uh, that I keep speaking about, and I also keep emphasizing that 
you know, trade deficits are, are not problematic if they're turned into opportunities. And this is where we need to invest a uh, significant time, effort, and resource um, in, um, in, in, in looking at how we can turn some of these deficits by identifying either product services and or sectors um, that we can mutually grow with our BRICS Plus partners. Um, turning the deficit into opportunity is really a very strong mantra of the South African chapter of the BRICS Plus Council. Um, not only does this serve a purpose of reducing the deficit and improving trade balances, and of course each of us in Africa uh, have to finance these trade imbalances and deficits through hard currency denomination. Um, so the uh, the impact is is a dual impact. Um, and uh, in in trying to address these uneven trade um, balances, uneven trade uneven trade patterns, uh, it is important that we consolidate together as a continent, and we begin again, as I said, to aggregate our volumes. And aggregating our volumes will give us some economies and improve our competitiveness. So, how do we look at this very high level? Um, uh, how do we look at um, achieving some of this? And um, the, I'll, I'll just do this high level. Uh, we intend doing this through strengthening economic partnerships, a partnership between Africa and BRICS Plus. Infrastructure and manufacturing development on the continent needs to continue to be a priority. And in our facilitatory role, and we have a particular working stream that deals with infrastructure and one that deals with manufacturing, is to continue to promote both of these. Financing cooperation, which is really the nexus to today's uh, a breakfast session, um, is a, a critical component to developing this industrial capacity and uh, evening our trade, our trade uh, imbalances. And then, of course, we will continue to be active in the areas of knowledge exchange and capacity building, particularly in areas such as technology transfer. In closing this session, a panel of industry experts delved deeper into current trade patterns between BRICS Plus members and the continent, as well as best practices to improve bilateral investment agreements. Right, I'm going to begin with the first uh, question segment around bringing the divide BRICS Plus AU and the infrastructure the imperative in Africa. I think all our speakers have alluded to that. How do we make sure we are moving forward? And just understanding that the African Development Bank highlights a significant 70 to 100 billion deficit in infrastructural investment throughout the African continent and also emphasizes the need for a substantial 6% GDP investment in infrastructure to achieve the growth rates that we are looking for going forward. And so considering the pressing need to address the substantial infrastructural investment deficit outlined alongside the critical coloration between infrastructure spending and sustained economic growth, I want to ask you, my panelists, what are the strategies as well as the collaborative frameworks that BRICS Plus can uh, nations deploy to enhance infrastructure development in East Africa? And in Africa as a whole, I'm going to ask with the East African Business Council, Mr. Kalisa, to respond to that question, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, allow me to congratulate you. I congratulate my sister from uh, BRICS uh, South African Chapter Business Council. And um, I give you a warm welcome to East Africa. Uh, to East Africa, uh, East Africa is one of the fastest growing regions among uh, the regions recognized by our African Union. And when you look at our growth, um, the currently we are posting around 5.4% growth. That growth is driven by three important factors. One is productive infrastructure. Two is our economic diversification. The third one is the, our deeper commitment to regional integration. Those are the building pillars of our economies, and uh, I think uh, when we talk about um, uh, infrastructure, and also let's look at the number. When you look at the current infrastructure trajectory in the continent or in the region, 
it is heavily um, funded by our government and the development partner. So the role of the private sector has been very marginal. It's, uh, it accounts for on, only 3%. So what means that, uh, how do we uh, transform this trajectory? We can only transform the trajectory by bringing or crowding in the private sector, bringing the private sector. How do we do, do that? We need to de-risk our infrastructure investment. We need to create an enabling environment for the private sector to pick or to uh, invest in infrastructure development, uh, both roads, ports, as well as uh, digital infrastructure. I'm happy this uh, annual meeting of African Development Bank is taking place in Kenya. And I was looking at the number. Kenya is now number one across the continent in terms of what we call e-digital infrastructure. And really we need to give a big round of applause to Kenya because our transformation now as a continent, as a region lies on digital innovation. So we need to infuse dig digitization, digital tools within the infrastructure. And as I mentioned that uh, we need also to develop a very strong public-private partnership. I'm happy this uh, um, session and other session will be talking about transformation of Africa. And when you look at the transformation of Africa, I always use the, the word depth. Depth means that what we need to do a lot in terms of uh, uh, enhancing our economic diversification. We need to do a lot in terms of human capital. It is very critical as we um, work towards uh, the continental free trade area. We need also to ensure, and I think the previous speaker has mentioned, our exports, our export partners have been dominated by primary products. How do we do value addition? And when you look at the four value chains that have been highlighted under the African continental free trade area, how do we add value to our herbal culture product? The second value chain, is, which is very important, is pharmaceutical. And the third one is transport and logistics. Because transport and logistics is the, the lifeblood of the business. So we must ensure that we reduce trade costs by investing in maritime model transport. Not on red roads. Currently, when you look at our trade in East Africa, it's driven by roads. How do we also ensure that uh, our ports are very competitive? I was looking at the port uh, productivity. Our ports are not productive. Uh, and when you look at the, the, the ship turnaround time, it takes almost four days. In other words, it takes 24 hours. So how do we change that? How do also do we enhance other infrastructures like uh, our airlines, our ports, our waterways? So I think uh, as a region, what we are uh, doing as East Africa, we are trying to really encourage multimodal means of transport, investment in rail, investment uh, in waterways, uh, reduce a number of our regulatory hurdles. I was looking at the report by PwC. And when we look at the four binding constraints for attracting investment in our region and our continent, one is our geopolitical tensions. The second one is inability for our infrastructure to stimulate growth. And the only, when you look even at the East Africa, uh, the recent report by the, World, uh, by the World Bank indicated that when we develop infrastructure, we'd be able to add 2% to our GDP, 2% to our gross domestic product. Currently, we are adding 1.4%, but we can double that by investing in various infrastructure, including digital infrastructure. The third aspect that is very critical... Mr. Kandisa, can I just ask you to wrap it up because I the, need the, to... The, go thir on. the third you. aspect that, uh, uh, that is very inter interesting, and I was uh, speaking to the, the chairperson, we need to facilitate movement of our people because goods don't move around. So we need to encourage tra uh, visa openness. I'm happy in Kenya, they have completed, Kenya, Rwanda, have re completely removed the visa. And it is part of the infrastructure. People who don't move alone, they move with people. So let's dismantle all the barrier to trade. That's how we can infuse and develop our infrastructure and develop our continent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Khalid. A very, very loaded answer. I wish we had a longer day to actually just unpack it. I mean, you've already touched on the logistics around Africa. So I'm going to go quickly into the question around the AFCFTA logistics connectivity. And uh, last night, I remember our High Commissioner saying the AU has declared this is the year of AFCFTA. 
FTA. And so let's talk about the extension of Africa's transport network, which is crucial for fostering economic growth and development through the AFCFTA, particularly within the framework of its engagement with BRICS plus nations. And I want to ask this question, how can we effectively leverage the combined expertise, you've already alluded to that, around the resources and strategic alignment of BRICS plus nations in conjunction with the African Continental Free Trade Africa Framework to prioritize and expedite the development of key transport infrastructure projects across the continent. I want to give it to the lady sitting next to me, Josephine, if you can please answer that question. Thank you very much. And all protocols observed. Um, so there are already, as far as BRICS and BRICS Plus is concerned, there are already a lot of agreements that highlight collaboration. But for us as the IDC, you know, our mandate is uh, industrial development. So we are very much interested in uh, infrastructure that enables that industrialization to continue in the in the continent. We believe uh, that the muscle, and we've already heard the numbers uh, for, uh, to this morning, in terms of the numbers of uh, investments, the, the GDP, the size of investments in this particular countries and economies, that money can be brought into the continent for uh, further uh, investment. And so the collaboration is is strong. And, and I think what we do need to do is just to think innovatively as a continent uh, outside of the box to make sure that we package investments that can attract that investment. And of course, the operating environment uh, within, within the continent itself, it's improving, needs to improve a lot more than it has happened at, at the moment. So the the combined efforts of all of us to ensure that we attract investment and collaborate uh, is very, very important. And for us, clearly, through the value chain uh, focus that uh, as the IDC, we are looking through the complete ecosystem of value chains to support uh, industrialization in South Africa as well as in the rest of the continent. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate your streamlining. I appreciate your insights. And I want to throw... A similar question, though, uh, to Mr. Monale. How can our collaborative efforts streamline regulatory processes, promote sustainable de- development practices, and also facilitate the knowledge exchange? I think we heard one of our speakers talking about knowledge exchange this morning to ensure that Africa's transport network becomes that catalyst that we need for inclusive growth, regional integration, and our shared prosperity. Uh, Thanks a lot, uh, Namanang. I, I think I, I think we need to just uh, perhaps understand um, why first. Uh, over many years, uh, we've been talking about inter inter, um, um, inter trade or in, economic integration across border cross borders that has not really materialized. What, what have been the obstacles, right? Uh, so, as the as the new development bank, we we have a very uh, interesting project in in, uh, in in South Africa in Lesotho. Uh, the Lesotho Highlands uh, Water Project. We have learned quite a bit on that project. Um, just the dynamism and some of the challenges with uh, dealing with projects that require de-risking uh, across across borders. Uh, very, very complex. And the bank took a very um, jealous view that for it to happen, uh, we need to focus on de-risking it on, on the one side, which is on the South African side. Uh, South African government has been to, to, to provide guarantee on the on, 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 uh, on the project, and this is how the bank has been able to unlock. Uh, obviously, in in partnership with the African Development Bank, we've been working on that on that project, and this has been the challenge. Uh, in fact, across the continent, if you are talking about intra opportunities on on intra trade, because much of it depends on infrastructure that cuts across borders, uh, be it development of port infrastructure, rail infrastructure, um, and a, a project that is going to operate across South Africa and Mozambique, wh- whether it's a rail project or it's a pipeline project, is going to require collaboration. It's going to require interna- uh, international treaties. It's going to require government injection of seed capital. Uh, how do we resolve for that when there's imbalances in terms of capital flows? One country may be a uh, much more better place to be able to provide funding than the other country. How do we interpret those projects in terms of trade benefit? And how do MDBs like ourselves be able to come in and interpret this on the basis of trade, uh, trade facilitation, and not really about the commercialization of the project? I think those are very, very complex um, discussions that we must have. 
I mean, if you just also just focus a bit also on uh, the BRICS countries, if I have to bring that into the equation, the BRICS countries on how many of them are able to come into the continent, um, do uh, financing, do business in individual countries. Um, be it if the Chinese are doing projects in Kenya, are doing projects in Rwanda, they're doing projects. But many of those projects are really very much about facilitation of uh, trade uh, in that country and outward. It's not about the connection of the different, uh, you know, the connecting points between the particular countries. Whose responsibility is that? Whose responsibility is that? And I think the new development bank is probably better placed because it comes in uh, anew. Uh, we're able to reflect on why other Bretton Woods, uh, you know, systems have not worked as well, uh, and what what about the fundamental design that have created flaws to 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 to. Uh, uh, to, to to ensure that you know, the, the intervention doesn't happen at the rate at which it's supposed to happen. Some of the key, key pillars that we're bringing in, for instance, we come in and say, as an institution, when you come to countries, we're going to operate on the basis of country system. We're going to operate on the basis of uh, priorities for, for specific countries. Uh, what do I mean by that? When you say country systems, we mean that if you've got uh, procurement or you've got environmental standards, we're going to lean more on your standards rather than to impose our own standards. Uh, we're not going to dictate on which infrastructure matters for you as a country or as a region. So when you come into the region, uh, we're going to be focusing more on how we enable you to connect as a region, not how we interpret uh, projects that we think are going to make sense. for this. So it, I think it's very much about thinking about things differently, um, you know, appreciating that things have not worked, and there's a reason why things have not worked. Economic integration has been the focal point in the continent for many moons. Uh, let's first diagnose best on how it has not worked, and design mechanism for intervention on the basis of making it work. And I think trade uh, trade is going to be a pillar through which I think this connection is going to happen. I appreciate that answer, especially let's look at why it hasn't worked, because a lot of the times we just want to jump to the next thing uh, and we don't dissect what hasn't worked and also just involving countries and saying what works for you rather than dictating. Mbume, I'm going to end off this panel. I know we're pressed for time, but looking at the different uh, topics we are covering under this panel. How can Brand SA, from a communications and a marketing perspective, uh, communicate these interventions by Brand SA or any other nation brand agencies contribute towards inclusive growth in Africa? Well, Nomalanga, you know, I think the role that marketing and communication plays in this space is often underrated. Uh, the strategic importance of building awareness of the opportunities that we discussed just today. We haven't had that much time. We've been sitting here for uh, just about an hour, and we've discussed a vast number of opportunities that are available to 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 tap into as Africans, as businesses, and and also opportunities um, uh, that will foster uh, international trade with BRICS plus countries. So it is critical for us and for Africa especially to tell its own story, to be able to communicate uh, this narrative um, articulately and build awareness of what is available on the continent and what the country, the continent truly has to offer to the rest of the world. I think I'll end there, but I think let's not neglect the important aspect of communicating and building awareness so it's not only the few people that are in this room or in this meeting today that are aware of what is available. Thank you. I'm smiling. I think you saw me grinning as you started. I come from a marketing and a comms background and very key what you said, telling our story, our African story. There's actually a bank in South Africa right now that says your story matters. I'm not going to say which one because we have a bank right here. But I want to give each of you, literally, I'm humbly asking my panelists, your 60 seconds as you wrap up this panel, your say in terms of our topic. I'm going to start with you, Josephine, you're on my immediate. Thank you. So the 60 seconds is there are so many opportunities, intra-Africa connectivity, intra-Africa trade, value chain support, not only to ensure that we export and trade within ourselves, but also to export those goods that can be in the value chain of the rest of the world to ensure that we create employment, we create uh, sustainability, and that we continue to be strong in our continent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Josephine. Over to you, Mr. Kalisa. Yeah, with, um, I think um, uh, the CFTA presents enormous opportunities um, in terms of uh, poverty reduction, uh, in terms of job creation, uh, in terms of inclusivity. 
women and the youth are going to be the driving on the driving seat. So I think it is a high time we enhance our collaboration, enhance our partnership. Both the government, private sector, and civil society, we need to work together to achieve a win-win situation. This is the time for Africa. It's not tomorrow, it is today. Let's work together and change the narrative. Thank you very much. And over to you, Mr. Munale. Yes, I think an Africa needs to begin to solution for itself. Um, the, the FDB has been leading an exercise, in fact, to advocate for use of SDRs, um, SDRs in, in, in hybrid capital models. And, and at, at, at the main of the SDRs conversation is that these SDRs are sitting idle and they can be deployed uh, within MDBs uh, to enable better financing for MDBs, to expand the balance sheet of, uh, of MDBs. But the core of it is to address the concept of a shortfall of capital. If we're talking about the, the infrastructure gap in Africa, I think much of it is because uh, we deem that there is short, uh, you know, the shortage of, of, of capital. So how do we think along the very same lines and think of Africa resolving its own problems? Africa has reserves, FX reserves. Much of those reserves are sitting in other jurisdictions, resolving problems of other jurisdictions, working as capital in other jurisdictions. If we can find still another way in the very same uh, spirit of SDRs and say, how can African countries bring back those reserves to deploy those reserves as part of capital mobilization within, within the continent? And that within the very many other facets of um, you know, innovative financing that can be put in place for, uh, for, for investment in infrastructure within the continent. Then I think we will we'll make strides. We need a full day session on this panel. Can I hand over to Bufi? Uh, I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, um, South Africa has always taken an Africa agenda at multilateral platforms, whether it be BRICS um, or G20 or even strategic platforms such as the World Economic Forum. These platforms do offer plenty of opportunities uh, for the continent, for private sector. And I think now uh, we just need to ensure that we leverage the opportunities that have been paved by African governments for private sector. And it's important to understand that the GDP of South Africa compared to the other BRICS plus nations is marginally small. You look at China, for example, but however, that platform has somehow leveled the playing field for us as South Africa. Let's take advantage of what the opportunities um, uh, offer with those multilateral platforms and not ignore it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please give our panelists a round of applause. I'm going to ask them to sit and not leave, but I want to humbly acknowledge everyone that's come through, those that are watching online. And as we close off, please can I ask our chairperson, SA Chapter of the BRICS Business Council, Ms. Busi Mabuza, to come and do our closing. Thank you. May this just be the beginning of a very fruitful conversation for us all. I look forward to seeing the Kenyan business people, the continental business people that are here on our shores. And we will most certainly continue our engagement because it is important for the future of, the, of this continent that we hold hands together and make the continent be as we want to see it. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you, Chairperson. Right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Africa, your time is now. As we conclude, if we can please play our wonderful video. Celebrate with us as South Africa celebrates the 30 years of democracy. And over to the video. Thank you. This is who we are. More than 60 million different voices echoing in harmony from the southernmost part of the continent. Where ordinary people have carved their names in an extraordinary history by showing the world that peace is always better than war. Our reach is not limited by our borders, bringing joy in people's hearts and a spark of rhythm to their moves. This is the welcome home of opportunity, inspiring millions to look here in search of a better life. And sharing our best with the world, we are home to undulating mountains, flowers, 
endless seas, the beautiful animal kingdom, and the ever-changing seasons that color our world. We are the birthplace of humanity and the showcase of human excellence. We believe in South Africa. We are inspired by our victories of the past and our strong institutions to overcome the challenges of today and build a better tomorrow. This is who we are, South African. South Africa, inspiring new ways.